Via way what the heads. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30 minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Dan Novak. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Coming up on the program, Brian Lynn reports on the U.S. military's plans to fight the next pandemic. Ana Mateo brings us this week's words and their stories. Dan Friedel has this weekend's higher education report on deciding which university to attend. John Russell has a story on gambling in the United Arab Emirates. And Jill Robbins reports on how inflation has affected Peru's soup kitchens. But first, here is Brian Lynn. The United States military deployed about 24,000 troops to help state and local governments across the country fight COVID-19. That mission has ended, at least for now. The Department of Defense is making preparations for the next possible infectious disease spread. And officials are seeking to learn from the experiences of service members who took part in the COVID-19 mission. The experiences can help military leaders decide on the number and kinds of troops to deploy in case another pandemic or other world crises or conflicts happen, said General Glenn Van Herc. He heads the U.S. Northern Command and is responsible for defense of the homeland. Van Herc told the Associated Press that his command is rewriting the military's current pandemic and infectious disease plans. Officials are also planning war game exercises to test the abilities of U.S. military medical workers. Of the 24,000 U.S. troops deployed, nearly 6,000 medical workers were sent to assist in hospitals. About 5,000 troops helped give vaccinations. Van Herc noted that the ways military forces were used in the pandemic morphed over time. He said one of the main things the military learned was that the work of small teams proved to be more valuable than mass movements of troops and facilities. In the early days of the pandemic, the Defense Department sent hospital ships to New York City and Los Angeles. They also set up hospital operations in other states at the request of state leaders. The idea was to use the troops to treat non-COVID-19 patients so that hospitals could center on more serious pandemic cases. But while images of the military ships were powerful, many beds went unused. Fewer patients needed non-COVID-19 care than expected, and hospitals were still overloaded by the pandemic. This led to changes in how military forces were deployed. Troops were sent to hospitals to fill in for overworked employees or to work alongside them in additional treatment areas. Lieutenant Colonel Suzanne Cobley led an army team that was deployed to two hospitals in Grand Rapids, Michigan, from December to February. 
She spoke to Associated Press reporters about one patient the team helped at a Michigan hospital as the Omicron version of COVID-19 was quickly spreading. The COVID-19 patient was having severe breathing difficulties. But Cobley said all patient beds at the hospital were full. An Army nurse on her team knew of an open space in a temporary treatment area. The nurse quickly went into action, hurrying to get the patient wheeled to the area. During the process, the gurney struck a wall, damaging it a little. When she saw what happened, Cobley praised the nurse's drive to help her patient. The last military medical team deployed for the pandemic finished its assignment last week at the University of Utah Hospital. But officials say about 200 troops are being held on prepare-to-deploy orders through the end of May in case COVID-19 infections rise again. I'm Brian Lynn. And now, words and their stories from VOA Learning English. In many parts of the world, the flow of traffic is controlled in part by traffic lights. Typically, they have three colors, green, yellow, and red. Green means go. Yellow means proceed with care and be prepared to stop, and red means stop. But these colored lights are not only used to control traffic. When it comes to red and green, we also use those two in our English expressions. The most common is the green light. Green light means to have permission to go ahead with a project. In English, we often turn verbs into nouns and nouns into verbs. For example, sometimes we use go ahead as a noun. If you have been given a go ahead to proceed with a project, you have been given the green light. Or in other words, you have been green-lighted, to use the past tense. However, we would not say that we have been go-aheaded. Making that past tense is simply not correct. When you get the green light, you can proceed. You have been given consent. A green light is simply permission to get started. This term is especially common in the film and theater industry. Producing films and plays takes a lot of resources, so getting the green light is important. For example, the company producing my friend's film refused to green light production until he did a big rewrite on his script. Now let's listen to these co-workers use the term green light. So when are you starting your new project? As soon as I get the green light, I can take the first step. The boss gave you the go-ahead in the meeting yesterday. No, she didn't. Yes, she did. I saw her. She nodded her head. That's not a green light. That's body language. 
for all I know, she could have been tired, and her head dropped forward slightly. No way. I've known her for years, and that is definitely how she greenlights a project. In fact, just last week, she greenlighted a bigger project than yours with just a wink. That's a shockingly subtle way to authorize a project. Perhaps, but also smart. If it doesn't work out, she can say she never gave consent. Well, my project needs a lot of resources. So I'm going to need more than a wink and a nod before I proceed. What more could you need? Oh, I don't know. Maybe something in writing? Like an email? Now, a red light used as a traffic signal means stop. This is also true in conversation. It means an order or directive to stop an action or project. During the pandemic, many companies put a red light on all unnecessary costs. Although this usage is less common than green light. A red light can also mean a signal of danger or a warning. For example, always being late for work could be a red light for a larger problem. Used this way as a warning, we could also say red flag. There is another way we use red light. Sometimes we combine it with the word district. In a red light district, adult entertainment is sold. And that's the end of this words and their stories. Until next time, I'm Ana Mateo. Students have until the end of April to tell the universities that have accepted them if they will attend. Most students found out if they were accepted in late March. Some students are accepted by their top choice school and immediately decide they will attend it. Others get rejections and must choose another school. Still, others are placed on a waiting list and might not find out if they are accepted to their top choice until the summer. After all the studying, tests, and applications, students are usually happy to be accepted by several schools. But choosing a college is not easy. This year, the decision might be more difficult than ever. Colleges and universities around the U.S. are reporting much lower acceptance rates. That includes Rice University in Houston, Notre Dame University in Indiana, the University of Southern California, and both Brown University and Harvard University of the Ivy League. VOA spoke with two experts who explained why the rates are so low. Because of the COVID-19 pandemic, many students delayed college, they said. In addition, thousands of universities decided not to require standardized tests. As a result, this year, universities received many more applications than usual and have fewer places for students who are finishing high school this year. Nicole Percaro runs No Anxiety Prep an educational advising company near Washington, D.C. A lot of students who in previous years thought they were shoe-ins for certain schools 
have not been accepted, she said. Porcaro said some students she works with are now deciding between their second choice schools. I encourage them to try to understand, which is really hard at that age, that plans and dreams change. And it may seem that you are 100% locked into a school or a major or a plan, and it changes. Alex Coupe is an advisor for a company called Empowerly, based in San Francisco, California. In the past, he was an admissions counselor at Stanford. He said some students feel stuck. Rice, a highly rated school in Houston, Texas, accepted only 2,691 students out of over 31,000 who applied. Yvonne Romero da Silva is the school's vice president for enrollment. Romero da Silva said students deciding between more than one college should think about the one they feel most connected to even if it is not the one with the highest rank. Each institution has a unique element to it, culture to it. So I I feel sad sometimes for the students who felt forced to make that decision um, of where they're going to go simply because the school was ranked higher than the school that they really, really loved. Romero da Silva said many parents can get caught up in a school's rank but the important thing for them to do is help their children get excited about going to a school where they will thrive or do well. This year, many universities opened their campuses to visitors and are not closed because of COVID-19 restrictions. So, Romero da Silva said she believes high school students who went to events for prospective students will have an easier time deciding if they want to attend the school. Rice hosted its event for visitors, known as Owl Days, recently. Rice's campus is so beautiful, you just can't get a sense of the physical spaces until you're actually here, Romero da Silva said. Many universities offer more chances for students to visit before requiring a decision. The experts said this is extra helpful for graduate students. They may be able to visit a laboratory or to meet with a professor who will guide their studies. Both Coupe and Porcaro said it is unlikely, especially this year, that students will be accepted from waiting lists, but they should accept a place on the waiting list quickly. The next step is to contact the school and express interest for a second time. This is called a letter of continued interest. The document should include any new information about the student. The new information does not have to be curing cancer, Porcaro said, but as long as they can show they've been using their time well and not coasting. The next thing students should do is send in money to hold their place at another school, Coupe said. This is called a deposit. They may lose the money if a spot at their first choice school opens. But the peace of mind is precious at this stage, he said. As the year goes on, send a short update every three to four weeks, Coupe added. Porcaro said there is a lot of information available for international students. They should attend as many computer-based activities as possible. She also discussed a company called College Scoops that presents independent visits to college campuses. Coupe said international students who are on a wait list should use two strategies. Tell the university that they do not need financial aid and consider centering their studies on a different subject. The subject can always be changed later. After all, many American students do it. And a lot of schools in the country, you can change your major on the first day of college back to biology. 
Students change their mind here all the time. I'm Dan Friedel. International casino owners are setting their sights on a new area, the United Arab Emirates. Ras al Khaimah, one of the smaller and lesser known of the seven emirates, said earlier this year that it planned to make laws about gaming in some resorts. On the same day, Las Vegas casino giant Wynn Resorts said it would build a resort approved for gaming, or gambling, on a man-made island. The announcements could mark an important moment for the Gulf, a part of the Middle East that has traditionally had stricter Islamic rules. Gambling has long been off-limits. Currently, those seeking to gamble go to the likes of Lebanon's Casino du Liban, or some Egyptian hotels. Yet times may be changing. Two people with knowledge of the issue told Reuters that gambling in some form would be permitted in the UAE. But, they added, it would be up to each emirate to decide whether and how to make rules about it, similar to how Sharjah does not permit alcohol sales unlike other emirates. They also said the policy change would happen soon, without providing an exact date. Casino and hotel companies that have moved into the UAE could benefit should Ras al Khaimah make the way for other emirates to follow. Caesar's Palace, which opened in Dubai in 2018, and is the only one of American giant Caesar's Entertainment Resorts without a casino, told Reuters that it would examine any possibility of offering gambling in Dubai. About ten kilometers along Dubai's coast from the Caesars Resort, digging has begun on another area to support a new resort by Las Vegas gambling company MGM Resorts International. When asked whether it would consider introducing gaming at the resort, MGM said, Gaming has not been part of the planning, and there are no updates to our plans. The UAE government media office, as well as the media offices of the Emirates of Dubai, Abu Dhabi, and Sharjah, did not answer requests for comment on Ras al Khaimah's plan to permit gambling and whether they planned to make similar changes. The possibility of gambling plays out against a situation of strong competition in the Gulf, with the UAE competing with Saudi Arabia to become a popular destination in a part of the world moving away from oil. The UAE, where foreigners make up 90% of the population, has already moved in other areas to keep first-mover advantage over Saudi Arabia. The Emirates changed to a Saturday-Sunday weekend this year to move closer to international markets. A Friday-Saturday weekend is common in many Muslim nations. In the past 18 months, the UAE has made legal changes, including decriminalizing alcohol use and situations in which unmarried people live together. The country has also found ways to offer some games of chance. In 2020, it started a national lotto. Players bought a collectible picture of a UAE scene, such as the Burj Al Arab Hotel, for $9.50. The buyers were entered into a draw. Now, players seeking to enter the draw buy a bottle of water to be given to a charity to win a top prize of 10 million dirhams. The game is considered acceptable under Islamic law because there was an exchange of value in the purchase of the collectible or bottle. 
Ras al Khaimah stressed that its laws, being developed by the recently created Department of Entertainment and Gaming Regulation, would push for responsible gaming. Vitaly Umansky, a gambling industry expert at the Stanford C. Bernstein Investment Company in Hong Kong, suggested that gaming in Ras al Khaimah would likely be limited to foreigners. I'm John Russell. In the hilly slums of Peruvian capital Lima, soup kitchens provide free food to some of the nation's poorest people. Recently, however, they have had to cut proteins like meat substantially as the cost of food climbs. Now, workers at the soup kitchens are telling those they serve not to look for chicken in the chicken soup. For us as soup kitchens, chicken has ceased to exist, said Jennifer Mondalgo, president of a soup kitchen group in the Pamplona Alta area. The rise in prices is huge. Soup kitchens serve meals to the needy. The food is either free or provided at a very low price. But the war in Ukraine has disrupted fertilizer and food supplies, causing inflation. For years, Lima soup kitchens have offered lunch at one sol, about 27 cents. But now, community leaders have been forced to raise the price to 1.5 soles. Mondalgo said they have sought free bones skins or other parts of the market so that they can serve at least a little animal protein. In the poor neighborhood of Pamplona Alta, people even look for food in the trash. Peru's inflation is at its highest in 25 years, affecting food prices more than other goods. The high prices have already brought nationwide protests that have left the government trying to find ways to cut costs. Peruvian President Pedro Castillo wants to drop sales tax on some foods to help lower costs. But he is still debating the issue with the country's Congress. Peru has also raised the minimum wage by 10% and offered to help with the cost of cooking gas for the poor. Things like vegetables and potatoes used to be cheap. Now they are super expensive, said Elena Rodriguez, who lives in Pamplona Alta. I don't know what to do anymore. Recently, a soup kitchen in Pamplona Alta served rice and vegetables with an increasingly rare treat, chicken soup. The chicken bones came from a donation at the market earlier in the day. The Peruvian government says vegetable oil has increased 50% in the past year. That has forced poor Peruvians to find other sources for cooking oil. Some reuse animal fats left from earlier meals. If soup kitchens ceased to exist, our lives would be terrible, said Maria Sanchez. She spends almost 200 soles a month at her local soup kitchen to feed lunch to her family of six. We wouldn't know what to buy because everything is so expensive at the market. I'm Jill Robbins. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Dan Novak.